Hola familia, welcome to En La Sala, a show where you join me, Eva Luna, in my living room to talk about all things happening in my life right now, in this changing world and in our community. Today, I have two very special guests joining me on the podcast, Pastor Rich Wilkerson Jr. and his beautiful wife, Don Cherie Wilkerson. We talk about divine timing, mental health, trouble with conceiving, and so much more. So take a seat, because we're about to spill the cafecito. I actually believe it is our great challenge of our generation. Like if someone walks into church with a big cast on, what does everyone do? It's like, oh, make way, like, let's get them a good seat. And like, are you okay, are you okay? But if someone says I'm depressed, or if someone's dealing with some sort of an anxiety disorder, or if someone's attempted suicide, in the church at times, it, it gets looked down upon that you are, hey, just control that. I think the most important step for anyone is, is sharing what's going on in your life. Not, not keeping all the thoughts of defeat and feeling overwhelmed, trapped in your head. If you rob people of the opportunity to stand with you, like in the valley, in the tough times, then you rob them of the, of the incredible joy that comes when you see a prayer answered. Let's get into it. The topic today is spirituality. I wanted to have this conversation with my pastors because they kind of helped me get to a point in my in my relationship with God where I knew that that's something that was a non-negotiable for me. And it's something that that makes me feel so many things every time that I'm, I'm in an encounter with God and that I'm in, you know, that moment that I just want you guys to be able to get some something out of this conversation and maybe feel that too in your own way. It doesn't have to be exactly how I look at spirituality. It doesn't have to be, you know, exactly what we believe, but it's always good to, to kind of find a motivation to search within and to have that moment where you're just connected spiritually. I think we are, you know, a, a big part of us. Most of us is spirit. So being able to connect that is incredibly important. And I just wanted to share that with you to see if I could spark a little bit of that joy and what I feel in you. Familia, joining me now are pastors Rich Wilkerson Jr. and Don Cherie. They are the lead pastors of Vu Church. Rich is an incredible author. Don Cherie is known for her tattooable sermons. And I also have to mention that they are the parents of three beautiful babies. How are you guys? What's up? We're doing wonderful. Thank you for having us to your living room. We've always wanted Thank to come you. into your living room. This is a, it's a nice living room. My, it's my current actual living room does not look like this. I know, that's the, so you're in a new house right now, but I feel like you've been there for a while, but there's no furniture and there's, what, what do you have in there? There's no, we have um, a kettle okay. and the bed. And this, the set, very that's it. Tempur-Pedic? Yep, uh, no, it's not actually, but it's all organic. It's amazing. It's coming uh, along great. It's coming along. We've had it for a year and a half and it's been our day, day three of sleeping in it. Let's go. So we're excited. Congrats. Thank you guys, but I'm happy to be back in Miami. Yes. It's been a year. And I, when I was away, I've, I was connected to VU with the podcast. Good. Thank goodness you guys had that podcast so I could feel at home because I was away for too much time and I never found a church over there where I could, you know, feel like I was home. Mm. So thank you guys for having that. Absolutely. And you guys opened a new location, yes. Yes. which is exciting. And I haven't, I haven't been in person since before COVID. It's crazy. Oh, miss you. Isn't that crazy? But you're doing great stuff. I We're cheering it. you on every step. I think that's the cool thing about technology is being able to be a part of community from wherever you are. And the hidden silver lining of the last two years is that it pushed us to really lean on technology to get it to people who couldn't come and gather. Yeah. So we've missed you all the time then. I want to know what you guys are excited about. Like what's, what's coming up? What, what has you guys excited with church? Well, so many things are happening. We just, we, we are, what, 13 weeks ago, yeah. Dontree gave birth to our, our third child. Oh and so we have three little kids. Our oldest, his name is Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson. And he's a miracle child because, I you know, know, we went on an eight-year journey of infertility. So eight years of trying to have kids, praying, yeah. hoping, and a lot of opposition. But after eight years of waiting, uh, our greatest miracle yet, God gave us a healthy baby boy. Eight and years. Yeah, eight, eight years. Is new beginnings. It new is. Beginnings. It is new beginnings. Incredible. And that was really, really significant to us. And so really Wyatt was born. And then the next year, Wild Wesley was born, which is... <laughs> and he's wild. Yeah. Like, he's I don't crazy. Know, he lives I'm, up to his name. I don't know if that was the smart 100%. name. Bro. Probably not. This 100%. is nuts. 
But then 13 weeks ago, we just get uh, our, our favorite child or my favorite child. Uh, <laughs> we have a little a baby girl, and her name's Waylon Wesley Wilkerson. And so I love the www. Yeah. You know, it's like it's World a Wide Web. Thing. It's so good. We like alliteration, you know. It's amazing. <laughs> so I think that's got us like our house is just busy and chaotic, which you will soon discover. Not and a find lot of out. sleep, a whole lot of love. It's, it's good. It's crazy because I remember um, after you had, I think it was after you had Wyatt. We had a conversation. I, we went to breakfast together. Yeah. And um, I was kind of sharing how doctors told me a million times that I wasn't able to have children, that I wasn't going to be able to have children, and that um, it was going to be impossible because of my hormones mm. and because of all these other things that supposedly, you know, weren't okay in my body. And, um, it, I mean, here we are. Here we we are. started trying, like— Come on for a, a really uh, little amount of time and it happened. And I just love that like, it happens whenever it has to happen, you know? Mm. Yes. And, and God is so faithful in, in your life and in ours. I, fe I feel like, I don't know, being able to kind of stay, after the conversation we had together, you, you always told me like, don't believe what they say, kind of, you know, stick to what you believe in and what God has said in your life. And it's what I did. And it happened right away. So it's really cool um, to see how how it's happened in both of our lives. And I'm like, beautiful. I don't know. I'm a baby still. I don't know how yeah. it's going to happen. Oh, you're <laughs> the best mom ever. ever. You I'm already excited. are. You know, this kid is blessed. I love you. And I think the beautiful thing about the journey is I, I learn so much from my kids every day. Like it changes me daily, what they teach me to live in the moment, to be present, to not sweat the small stuff and I think that journey of faith, it just strengthens your marriage. You know, it, we didn't put the pressure on each other. Neither one of us could make that miracle happen. Yeah. It's only God. So we had to rest in that. So did the two of you. And I think the way that you've shared the journey is so special. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. I sent it to my whole family oh, video. My dad, who's like a football coach, he's like in the, the football field house with his whole team. He put it on the screen because anything I send him, he just wants to watch immediately. He texts me. He's like, I'm crying oh, in, the, in the field house watching this. Dad. There's so much love, so much joy. I think it's what the world needs. Yeah, People beautiful. are looking for stories of hope. They're looking for people that are authentic with their lives. And I think you walked that out. I think what's really cool too is like just the idea and the concept of like timing. And yeah. I think a whole lot of people, uh, everybody in life is waiting for something. Like, you know, you're waiting to get married, you're waiting to have a child, mm -hmm. you're waiting for a promotion, you're waiting for furniture in your house. Yes. <laughs> and I think that if we're not careful, what will happen is that we'll find ourselves in these like waiting seasons. And what will happen is a waiting season will start to be a season that we waste. And I think yes. we have to all kind of learn some valuable lessons that a waiting season doesn't have to be a wasted season. How cool is that, that here you are today with a great testimony, a witness of the fact that even though there was an obstacle and there was negative news given to you, you didn't give up hope. You didn't, you didn't doubt, but instead you just activated your faith. You continued to live your life. And today I think there's a miracle on the inside of you. And it's really, really beautiful. And isn't that interesting? I think like sometimes in the struggles, we, we learn more than we do in the victories. Like I've learned a lot more in the valleys of life than I ever have on the mountaintops. 100%. And also it's really cool to be able to share this with people because so many people are struggling with that, not just like infertility, but with the waiting the people. Waiting. I think that the waiting is like the most complicated thing to, to understand and to be like, my faith is still just as strong in the waiting. I think whether you're waiting, you know, to meet that special someone, to have a child, to get married, whatever it may be, it's like don't don't put your life on pause until you reach Very that good. marker. What what do you guys think that you do or in those eight years where you were waiting? Like what were the things that made you maintain your faith? Or maybe like even the not necessarily the routines or the things that you guys just had to make sure you had to make sure your faith kept growing. Mm. And even now, obviously, I'm guessing that there's moments where being a parent is complicated and you need to maintain oh, yeah. your faith every day. What's, exactly. What's funny is, or what's a scary thing in life is when you start complaining about the thing you were praying for. Right, right. <laughs> so I think every time we complain about those kids, it's like, oh my goodness. Yourself, but we've all done that, you know? Stop. I want a husband. And then you get when you're like, I don't like this husband, you know? I want a job. I hate my boss. We all, we all find that tension. Um, I think for me, the journey of, of learning to be vulnerable with my, with, the path that I was on. So if yeah. people are in a wait, whatever the wait is, because all of us are waiting for something, 
share with the right people mm. what you're waiting and praying for. Oh, that's I, awesome. I think our generation kind of has vulnerability a little mixed up. We feel like, you know, when we go on IG or when we go on Facebook mm-hmm. or when we share that as we blast it out to the world that somehow that's authentic vulnerability. Hmm. Um, I think real vulnerability is is walking the journey with specific people yeah, in your life that you trust, that you allow them to speak into your journey. And to be honest, when I found out that I was going to have trouble conceiving, having a baby, it took me a year to even tell my parents. Oh, wow. I was so like, wow. I was so uh, sure that I could fix the problem myself. Like I'll fix it before anybody even knows that it was an issue. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to worry anybody, not going to put that burden on anybody. And what I realized is it's not a burden on them. It's, it's the joy of life to walk alongside people. Friendship is such a gift. Took me a year. I shared it with my parents. Then I started to open it up to more of our friends. And I was really changed in those eight years of going, it's not sharing it with everyone. It's sharing it with the right people because I need their encouragement. I need them to be able to check up on me. And and just as important as the people who celebrate with you when the miracle or the breakthrough comes Mm -hmm. are the people that prayed with you all along. Yeah, that's very And if if you rob people of the opportunity to stand with you, like in the valley, in the tough times, then you rob them of the of the incredible joy that comes when you see a prayer answered. It's very good. So because I decided finally to open up and share it with the people that I loved, those people stood with me on one side and on the other side, they were all ready to celebrate when we got the news. So I learned that these last four months as well. Yeah. Because in the tough times with Kami, I was able to be vulnerable and share it mm. with my family, being obviously super scared to share it with them or or whatever, just because it was always okay with me and Kami. Like, yeah. We were always the perfect relationship, yeah. the relationship that wasn't jealous, a relationship. And we got to a point where it was like, it's totally okay to be jealous of the person that you, like the good, the good jealousy. I don't yeah. know how to explain it, but sure, you yeah. know, just like to, to want to take care, protecting the person that's next to you. And these, um, these last four months, I learned that with that situation and also with the whole baby situation. Yes. When I was, when I had just gotten pregnant and like I, I saw the, the thing for the first time saying positive, I was like, I want to tell like all these important people. And, and some people told me like, don't tell them yet because, you know, you never know. It's, mm. it's not a good time to tell them. And I'm like, but these are the people that I want to be there with me. Yep. Yes. Whatever the situation may be. Yeah. So I'm glad I was able to communicate it with them. And then two days ago with the rest of the world. But, but it's crazy. I think that that makes total sense. While you were talking, I remember um, a sermon that you guys did that was called, it was titled, Even If. I don't know if you yes. guys remember. Yeah. One of my favorites of all time. And I think it's it goes really well with what we're talking about yep. right now, in case you guys want to check it out. What's it's so really funny good. about that yeah. message is like Don Cherie, you know, it, I've been preaching since I was like 17 and our whole story, like <laughs> we started we started like doing young adult ministry in Miami Gardens, like back in like 2007 together. It used Rendezvous. to come, Rendezvous, yeah, back in the day. That's how, it's, how yeah. I started. We'll going spare to everybody the church history, but like ultimately like out of default, I was like, Don Shree, I don't, I need you to preach one of these Tuesday nights. And she's like, I don't want to preach. And I'm like, you, you got to preach. And so she started preaching. Of course, everyone has always loved her preaching much more than my Not preaching. True. And so throughout the years, like we just have funny stories. People walk up and it's like, yo, I got this new tattoo. And it's like, oh, right. it's like one of Don Shree's sermon titles. And this one's like, oh, I got this tattoo. It's like one of Don Shree's sermon titles. I'm like, dude. No one's ever gotten any of my servants <laughs> tattooed on their body, but Don Shree's got like dozens of tattoos. And then finally, like not too long ago, some kid walked to me and he's like, bro, even if. And so <laughs> when you just brought that up, I was like, Validated. yeah, no, it's, it's, I, I do remember that so message happy. because one guy out there has a tattoo. Yeah. So even <laughs> if, but yes. I'll, you know, I love, um, I, I'm thinking about how you said that a lot of people have picked Vu as their first church and that that's something beautiful. I, I remember Gami, um, he kind of, church is, I mean, Vu is pretty much his his first church. Yeah. And yeah. Um, when he started, he he was always very sensitive to uh, spirituality, and he was always searching and searching and searching. And when he came to Vu, he felt like he found something that he connected with and that he liked. And he had always explained that it was really hard, and I think it's something that a lot of Latinos um, struggle with which is how they were kind of raised either in schools that are um, super strict about 
certain religions and how there are certain words that would trigger kami um, that, I don't know, pastors used to use. And it was like this like super um, like intense way of, you know, sharing sure. the message of Jesus. And when he got to Vu, he was like, I think that my solution is listening to everything in English. I think this is the solution because I don't have any trigger words. But yeah, that's amazing. And I think that the Latinx community does struggle a little bit with mm. finding a home um, where they feel welcome because growing up Latino and in a community where sure. it's not that easy to talk about Jesus or when they talk about it, it's a way that like make, doesn't make you feel like you belong too much. Um, I think it's great to have a church like VU that kind of welcomes everyone, you know? At VU, I think what we've always tried to do from day one is have this little motto that says, you belong before you believe. And so you're looking for a community. I'm not saying this community is for everyone, but everyone is certainly welcome to come Love to this that. community. And I think that you can find friends, you can find a family. And I think leading with that motto has so allowed people to come in uh, from all sorts of different paths. We've got all sorts of different types of people in our church. We certainly have people in our church that don't follow Jesus yet. They're like, I just like the vibe. <laughs> you know? yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And I, guess what I say? I'm like, cool, keep coming. My job is not to change you. Some people have told me it's a free concert. <laughs> Still like having the people around me that are going through a whole bunch of things that are you know, either similar to me or a lot deeper than whatever it is that I'm going through. It's cool to, to see that we're all like finding um, refu refuge, yeah. Yeah. refuge in the same you know, place all together. We're in it together, you know. So I want to talk a little bit about mental health because it's such a touchy subject, but it's um, such an important subject that I feel like now we're kind of getting into more and more because of how much we need it. Um, what is the issue that you guys see like most common, I guess, in the people that are that are attending church, or what would you guys say like is so important about being aware of of your mental health and creating consciousness? Well, I think first of all that so many people are walking through loneliness very deep, debilitating loneliness. Loneliness that maybe they're surrounded by people. Yeah. Now that's that's the lie of loneliness that people don't understand. You can be surrounded by people and still feel so alone. Yeah. Because loneliness has way more to do with what's going on on the inside of you than what's going on around you. And even in this city, there's millions of people in this city. You would think there's you know countless opportunities for relationship and genuine, um, community, and yet people find themselves in this huge city with not one real authentic friendship that they can be honest about the loneliness that they feel and what they're walking through, the frustration. Why do I feel this way? Why am I waking up with this, um, this heaviness on my chest, going to sleep every night with this heaviness on my chest that I cannot seem to shake? And I, I think the most important step for anyone is is sharing what's going on in your life. Mm. Not not keeping all the thoughts of defeat and feeling overwhelmed, trapped in your head, but actually getting it out on the table in a conversation mm -hmm. right here, you know, in somebody's living room. This is what I'm facing. I think that's the first step to finding healing and and facing what you're what you're walking through. And mental health is I means such a big topic that we could we need to do another conversation yeah. just on it because yeah, I, I have think to add it's, a couple episodes. Yeah, yes. because there's just so much to it, but it's such an important thing. In fact, I actually believe it is our great challenge of our generation, mm -hmm. and I think that we need more resources and more conversations like this one. Um, I, I think let me stick just for a moment towards the faith sector because I think that the church at large for many, many years has done a poor job with this topic. Mm -hmm. And a, a big reason is because we've allowed a stigma to be attached to it. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up, ends up happening is that we've let mental health become people's identity. And I just don't think, you know, let me say it this way. It's not a sin to be sick. Hmm. And sickness is not your identity. Like if someone walks into church with a big cast on, what does everyone do? It's like, oh, make way. Like, let's get them a good seat. And like, are you okay? Are you okay? But if someone says I'm depressed or if someone's dealing with some sort of an anxiety disorder or if someone's attempted suicide, in the church at times, it, it gets looked down upon that you are, hey, just control that. You know, hey, just come on, get some willpower here going. And, and, and mental health is, is it's, it's like any other sickness. 
we need to treat it. We need to be aware of it. I think the church needs to be louder going, yo, like, this is not your identity, okay? We're going to get through this. Like, it's not because you're not spiritual enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not because you didn't pray enough. It's not because you don't read your Bible enough. Those aren't the answers that I would give. I certainly think prayer, I think God's word are definitely practices that you should apply to your life. But all of us should. I think when we start looking at the things attached to it, I don't know, there's so many things I start to point out. Um, Right now we know that anxiety is on the rise. We've never been more depressed, never had more antidepressants put out into the world. I I just said earlier, I mean, suicide, every 44 seconds, someone's uh, dying by suicide, 123 suicides a day. Um, Suicide now doubles the um, homicide rate. So like more people are dying by suicide than we are murdering each other. Second leading cause of death from 11 to 34 years of age. So this is like, wow. I think anyone who's listening right now, like, please hear us. Like, you don't have to die to end your pain. Mm. And that really has become a, a, a mantra that we speak out loud at VU to people because when you're saying, what are we seeing? I think we see everything. Everything walks through our doors. And there's lots of different things. Things that I kind of point to at times, a comparison culture. Mm. You know, I didn't know how unhappy I was until I discovered how happy you are. Yeah, wow. You know, and so what are we doing on Instagram? Yeah, look at me, look at my you know, <laughs> swag check. It's like, it's like we're, just, we're, we're sh- showing our fit. It's like, mm-hmm. all it is is a projection of happiness. But in all reality, there's, there's, there's another side to all of our lives. There's, there's failure, there's weakness, there's struggles. Right. But wow. if we're only looking at people's happy moments, it always magnifies my unhappy moment. 100%. Uh, it's not just that, there's triggers that happen right there. Like, you know, you used to break up with someone and be like, see, I'll never see you again. Now you go on Instagram, it's like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. She, wow, you found, he's way better. He's got abs, you know, like, and so you have to deal with that. Yeah. Um, I think that we live in, and we know right now the, the stat rates for this is an entire, for, for decades now, marriage rates in America are 50% and in divorce. Well, now there's been an entire generation of kids that have grown up uh, in, in broken homes, broken families, a fatherless generation. We've imprisoned so many people, so many men that haven't been with kids. Um, I, I would also point back to a narcissistic nation. This is, this is the most self-absorbed humanity maybe has ever been in, in history. Uh, this is the selfie generation. Uh, you know, like I remember one time uh, I tried to get a picture. I was like overseas and I was on like this cool like safari thing. I was trying to get a picture of this line. I went to like get the photo and like I wanted to be in it. And I took the picture and I looked back and it's like, there's no line in the picture. Oh, no. It's just me in the frame. You know, like like how many times is that? Like we're, we're just too big in the frame. Yeah. And so if the focus is always on me, I'm never going to discover purpose. Purpose is always found in, in, in serving others. So there's, there's a plethora of issues. What is the answer? I, I, would, I would go all the way back to where Don Shree's at. The, the starting place is, is that you need a safe place to talk about this. Hmm. Uh, there's nothing. I believe in therapy. I, yeah, I I'm a pastor who's like, go to counseling. I, I believe in medication done with the help of of professional doctors. Um, these things have got stigmas on them that sometimes people of faith have uh, made attachments to that I just, I don't believe it. I think that faith should help accelerate us into the forefront and into the future of finding out all the answers, all, all the ways that we can bring solutions into play. Wow, that's that's incredible. And I love how how much you know like the stats like you're super aware of it because it's something that you're constantly talking about and and I think it's helping do you guys think that quarantine um, oh my goodness you know, didn't help with this like it made it a little bit worse I think that quarantine shook everyone yeah and and really revealed a lot mm-hmm. I mean we could talk about that on a much broader scale beyond the realms of just mental health I think it revealed who we trusted in, what the foundation of our life was built upon. I think that the busyness Mm. kind of was a self-medication for a lot of people. I think in so many ways, 2020 was a wake-up call um, for all of us to take a real inventory. And I I really feel like 2020 was a wake-up call, an opportunity. A lot of people may look at it like, oh, it's broken beyond repair. But that's just not like what our faith uh, tells us. We believe that God can do anything. And even if people listening or watching right now are holding the broken pieces of their life going, 
there is no good, that that God can use it for good. Yeah, very good. That with surrender and trust, humility, that there's there's nothing that God can't do. There's no doubt though that the quarantine increased anxiety. I mean, we we know these facts now. We've yeah. seen it rise. And it shouldn't really surprise us that much. I mean, anxiety is birthed out of a word called fear. And fear by itself is not a bad word. Fear in many ways is a safety mechanism. You know, like uh, you, if you step out into the street and a semi comes by and you back up, you go, okay, well, that made me afraid. And now I know yeah. to look both ways before I go. And as time has progressed and as society and human beings have developed, I mean, in the very beginning days, you were just trying to survive. You know, you're eating off the land, but praise God, cities have been formed. Yeah. We have roofs and fears have diminished in certain categories. With that diminishing of fear in our brains, we've developed what they call the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is a portion of the brain that literally helps you predict the future. And so the way it does this is through information. And so we get information and we have experiences and then it takes all that information and it quickly helps you predict what's going to happen next. Where anxiety comes from is when my brain doesn't have enough information, enough experiences to form. So when COVID-19 hit, all you're doing is watching the news and maybe your drug of choice is Fox News or maybe your drug of choice is CNN. Either which way, there is information coming and every day our prefrontal cortex is trying its best to compute it all and all of a sudden, those that never had anxiety started to get anxiety. Those that were already struggling with anxiety, it increased to another level. And I, I think that, once again, the way that we answer these things is, is a series of responses. The biggest one for me is, is other people being involved in the mix. Yes. Other people being involved in the mix. Yeah, 100%. I agree. And I felt like, for me, um, when I, I started struggling with anxiety, I think we all do at some point. Sure. And, and um, when I started struggling with anxiety is when I was taking on some habits that weren't the ones that I, that I, that I feel like defined me or yeah. that God wanted me to be taking on. And I think that that's something else that I would like to talk about with you guys, like how important habits are in our day-to-day -day life, like whether they're good or bad, how they can define, um, how, how they can def define, you know, the rest of of your life and the rest of the path that you take. What do you guys think about habits? What do you, what would you say? It's, We're passionate it's, about habits. Yeah. I want to talk to you. I've, I've heard, I've heard about you guys it. talk about it. Well, but I, I, want to I think it's important because I think that once again, I think these are things that we can start to do. Yeah. And there's all sorts of different degrees of mental health. You know what I mean? And so I think it's always important when we're having the conversation to once again say like, this is not one size fixes all, you mm -hmm. know, it's not like one size fits all. This is, People have to go on their journey and they need help and they need coaches and they need therapists and they need doctors and they need friends and they need churches and pastors. For me in my life, what I've discovered is the power of practices. Yeah. And that practices create consistency for me. So what you do daily determines who you become permanently. That, awesome. That's the phrase. What I do daily determines who I become permanently. So what is a habit? Habit is an involuntary pattern or action that, that you almost do without thinking about it. Yeah. So for you, it's biting your nails. You didn't like, oh, I'm doing that again. Oh, I'm doing yeah, that again. Yeah, it was Camilo telling me every time, like, yeah. like this to my hand. Like, <laughs> so, so, noticing. So there's, there's, there's good <laughs> habits and then there's bad habits. And, yeah. and you know, habits, they, they make things permanent in our lives. And so for me, uh, I feel like during 2021, especially, or during COVID, it was such a journey where people were like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know what the answer is. And so what do you do when you don't know what to do? Hmm. The answer is you do your habits. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you have good habits or, or, or bad habits? I noticed that in quarantine too. Yeah. How, how also I went through a whole bunch of like stages in quarantine, not just like physically where I said, I'm going to get into doing exercise every single day. And I was super proud of myself and my habits were eating healthy and exercising yeah. and, you know, being trying to work on my holistic self and awesome. then it was like no quarantine is gonna be like just sitting back movies eating everything Us that i want so <laughs> i went through every single Us stage too. and i noticed how much habits do define like who you become basically yep. 
absolutely. Uh, I had all the same things. I mean, I joined a swim team during COVID. He really did. Uh, I also became a professional Netflix binge watcher. Yes, same. If they were paying me to watch (laughs) Netflix series, you know, I would be a very wealthy man. Um, You kind of had to adapt, though. It was like, even with our kids, they hadn't watched much TV, but like, you're in the house. There's only so many things that you can do. And so it changed a lot of our habits. I, I think when I think about habits, for us, it's not so much what you take out. Like, it's important to take things out. Yes. Like, we're always editing. You edit your closet. It's important to take inventory of your habits and go, what needs to go? What's not, mm-hmm. like, needed in this season anymore? But we make a mistake when we just remove things and we don't put the right things back right. in. Mm-hmm. And so it's not just, I, I want to get rid of the negative self-talk. I want to stop talking down to myself. I'm not being kind the way, I'm not speaking life over myself. It's also like, well, now I need to actually be intentional about what I'm, what I'm saying. What am I speaking to my heart? What am I believing for in the future? And so habits, I think it's not just what you're taking out. It's also like, what am I putting in? Absolutely. I think for me, there's just been, sometimes it's just starting with something simple, like going, okay, what is something that I'm going to add to my life that I'm going to commit to? Part of the idea of like commitment is that when I commit, that's the thing, that's that's the bond. Like that's that's the, the characteristic. That's the value of my life. Now I'm a person of commitment. Like, I have to go to the gym. I don't go to the gym for for vanity reasons. I go to the gym for sanity reasons. You know, like, yeah. like, like I've learned that while my mental health and my degrees of anxiety are very, very connected mm-hmm. towards uh, the physical exertion I put out, yeah. they say something like three walks uh, a week helps, you know, take away literally anxiety. I think sometimes we get so lost in our thoughts and it's like, what are practical things that we can do? For me, uh, some of my habits are I've got to I've got to work out four to five times a week. I've I've got to be reading something. Like I need to be learning something. I need to be in some other area. I need to have a certain dosage of just God's word in my life. It's not from some legalistic standpoint. It's not like I read 14 chapters of Leviticus today. It's more like I just need <laughs> somewhat of God's word in my life. And I'm another, still, I still struggle with Leviticus. Yeah, I still, yeah. I still we're not, step that's by That's another step. show. Okay, we got, <laughs> we got more. We're, we'll break that Camilo, one down another time. You have to have a conversation with Camilo about Leviticus. Oh, yeah. He is the most passionate person about Leviticus. and It's he, a strange it's book. It's wonderful. But he, you have no idea how, He's how much it. he loves it. Like how he, Let's how do he, it. I can't wait to talk to him about it. Oh, Let's do it goodness. again. We'll get all four of us. Yes. Just be like Leviticus for an hour. Like, yes. why are we talking about this? <laughs> but number four for me is like, I have to teach something every day. Right. So like, if I woke up and I read something, I try to figure out how to, how to bring that into my life. And the reason why is because I've discovered what are motivating factors for me. And I think when you're given a platform, you have to realize that people are picking up habits from you. Hmm. That your example it matters, that's, you know, and that's such a all of us, we have habits that we don't even realize are habits because it's just the way we were raised. Yeah. So it's just like, oh, this is how I am. And so when we walk into something like a relationship or marriage, it's like a lot of times our habits on communication come from what we've seen, mm-hmm. whether it's uh, the way that our parents spoke to one another. Yeah. Did the volume get high and mm-hmm. hot when there was a disagreement? Well, that's probably a habit I'm going to bring. You know, and it's like awakening to the habits that we've just picked up, not by design, but by default. Mm. Like this is, these are habits that I've brought. Well, then when you recognize them, then you can start to have conversation. You know, when I have a disagreement, do I just ice the person? Do I, do I go stone cold, ignore them? Or do I come face to face and say, hey, can we work this out? Like what, what habits do I have when it comes to forgiving others? What habits do I have in communicating in healthy ways? In my marriage, what habits do I have to like fight fair? My habits with my kids, like what's the tone I'm setting in the mornings for them? It can be messy. There can be spills. There can be tears because they're moody or sleepy. But, but what am I saying and what am I doing to create a routine of health and joy in my home? Like I think it, it goes so much deeper than just like, did I floss today? Yeah. You know, did I do this or this or that? It's also like, what atmosphere am I creating? And I think that that really comes down to creating a habit of, of making your home full of joy and life. It starts like within us. I think it's a good daily question to have, right? To, yeah. to constantly be asking yourself like, okay, what are my habits in this moment? Because I do think that they shift. Yeah. So being able to ask yourself the question and like, 
putting it all out there and seeing which ones you're liking and which ones are defining you in a And way here's the question, who are you becoming? Yes. That's a good question, who are you, you becoming? asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. I'm becoming a mom. Yes! <laughs> it's becoming Indigo's mom. It's incredible. Yeah. It's a big You question. are. Yeah, it's you incredible. are becoming a mom. What, what do you guys think would be like the top three tips that you would give me wow. to becoming a mom? We're like learning. practical tips. Well, oh. practically for you, uh, you're gonna do great because mm-hmm. what I firmly believe in life is that you teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. Mm-hmm. And who you are is, I think, top notch in my book. And so wow. uh, I think True. this little baby's gonna be phenomenal. But Dontree is the one, she's got really good tips for parenting. <laughs> well, like, put her on the spot. I agree yeah. with Rich. I think everything that your parents have Both deposited you in your life and the people that you've decided to walk alongside, Camilo, like the two of you together, this this child is blessed. Like, and and God has has given this child to you guys for this moment. So you're already ready. You don't have to go like, oh, is it too soon? Is it too, mm-hmm. is it right? No, it's, it's this moment. God's decided to bring this child into history at yeah. this wow. moment. And you already have everything that you need for the journey. God's going to lead you. But I think that I would say be kind to yourself. Because every day as a parent, wow. you feel inadequate. You don't have all the answers. You get overwhelmed. Like well, I've every day felt is different. It. Yeah, you already feel I've it. I've already felt it when I was sick and with my with my morning sickness. I was like, I'm not being a good mom. I can't eat anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not giving my baby food. It's a, it's a yeah. humble experience. I think I think a big piece of advice that maybe would some would find slightly controversial or maybe not agree with, but I firmly believe it, is this: is that your first priority is to Camilo, not to those kids. And yes. um, I think the more that you and Camilo love one another and mm-hmm. serve one another, the more that your children will benefit because uh, what brought this child into the earth was your deep passion for one another. Mm-hmm. I think so often kids come into the play and it's like, all right, now let me all of a sudden make you my priority. The reality of it is, is that it's hard to hear it, but you're raising this child to let this child go. Yeah. We are, we get, we get, a few years with these beautiful boys and this little girl, and we are we are raising them to release them. We are raising them to send them into a world. And uh, the reality of it is, is they're gonna leave my house one day, and guess who's still in my house? Yep. And uh, <laughs> hopefully over Thank those goodness. yeah, hopefully <laughs> over those eighteen to twenty years, hopefully we didn't just depart from one another, yeah. and hopefully we didn't you know stop dating one another. Right. But hopefully we we kept the fire alive, and I think that. Um, your children will benefit as they witness the love in your home for one another, the respect for one another. Uh, more is always caught than taught. And uh, mm. I would say keep doing what you're doing. And, and create your own traditions and don't feel pressure to, to have your family look like everybody else. Mm. I think there is so much pressure that a birthday party should look like this yeah. and being pregnant should look like this and my nursery should look like this. Mm. I think the most important thing, way more important than the outfits your kid has on or how cute their bedroom is, which you already got that on lock. I don't even have to worry about that. But way more important than that is that you have peace in your heart yeah. because as you have peace in your heart and you feel settled, that baby is going to sense that. And is going to feed off of that. Yeah. And your home and the atmosphere is so much more important than even like the decor or anything else. Celebrate. Um, celebrate the moment with real intentional joy. You know, lean into the day-to-day. Be grateful. After eight years of like praying for a baby, mm. one, of, one of my spots where I thank God is at the changing table. Like wow. I can be changing dirty diapers. I'm like, God, thank you. That's I have a baby. Incredible. Like this baby's <laughs> healthy. His organs or her organs, they work properly. Yeah. I'm grateful. Thank mm. you for this moment. Find little intentional spots to do that. That's incredible. I can't wait for Kami to listen to this podcast because mm. I know he's going to love it and he's going to agree him. with everything. So thank you guys for the tips. Mm-hmm. Speaking about traditions, so we have this thing yes. in this uh, podcast called Ni de aquí, ni de allá. Okay. Which I'm not going to explain what it means because oh. I wouldn't know how to say it in English. But just say, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And um, it's mi, just mi a question. Mi español más o menos. Tu español más o menos? Yeah, so, so. Don't touch him. I love Don't it. do it. We have Fail. to know. I'll ask a, couple, uh, a few questions yeah. in a little bit. But um, it's, a, it's a question about the traditions that you guys have had in your families. Mm-hmm. So, like, what is a, a family tra- Latinos have 
a lot of traditions. For I don't know why, but there's just like really specific traditions that are are like super alive in families and generations and generations. And generations. So, um, what is one that you guys would say like, oh, this is a tradition that my family has had for years, and and we are gonna do it with our children too. Do you guys have? Okay, so there's one. I know you're probably yeah, gonna say it, but in both of our families, um, that's if be- it's your birthday. <laughs> You, we call it the honor circle. Yeah. Oh, we I actually it. brought it to VU. Everybody at VU knows about we it. We brought it to our you home. Did? Yes, we awesome. did? Yes, Awesome. So if it's your birthday, like you go around the circle and everyone who's there at the celebration takes a moment to articulate how, um, how thankful they are for you. Yeah. It's a moment right. of honor. It's exactly what it is. You go around the circle. And I think it taught me at a young age to be able to communicate how I feel. Yeah. And wow. to be able to be grateful for people and not just feel it in my heart, mm-hmm. but actually speak life over them. And it it doesn't even have to be your birthday. But as you go around the circle and people share, it's like your heart just gets full, full, full. And you go out of there feeling like you can do anything. I want my kids to grow up with like intentional life being spoken oh, over them. What it's it, His family does it too. Absolutely. That's I insane. definitely got to repeat the honor circle. When I was a kid, it's weird now because I'm 37 and my brothers live in different states. Don Cherie's family all lives in Louisiana. So a lot of the traditions I grew up with they don't really exist anymore, which is exciting because now with three of our own kids, we get to start mm-hmm. some traditions. Yeah. But one of the great traditions that we definitely need to bring back is uh, every Thanksgiving in the Wilkerson house, we would have a, all sorts of people over. And <laughs> for Thanksgiving, all the guests that would come in, it would be like 20, 30 people. Everyone had to bring a talent with them. And so you'd have the Thanksgiving no meal way. and then everyone would go downstairs and there was a massive <laughs> no talent way. show. And I, when I say talent show, it's We like, got to bring this back this for real, though. Like, no, was it was ever... awesome. Oh, it was like Elvis it. Presley <laughs> you know, performed. You know, he lived for it. Elton John of was doing Benny did. and the Jets Puppet at my show? Thanksgiving. Stop it. Yeah, I did Pee Wee Herman's Playhouse. You guys don't even know about Pee Wee Herman's Playhouse, but <laughs> stuff changed my life. And so I feel like as <laughs> the boys are a little bit older, it's me like, hey, Wilkerson's Thanksgiving, bring your talent. So like when we have Evan... Camilo at the house, it's going to be awesome because you guys could just like do your latest record. I don't think we would do that. We would probably find something. No, you have to do, you have to make it like a shtick. You have to do something something different. I love it. That's so good. And your families are so big that, yeah. There's a whole Thanksgiving must be a whole show. Chief entertainment, you know, but it was very satisfying. So, rapid fire music round because music defines us. Yep. Music is like a part of us forever. Yes. So, I have a couple questions to ask you, but you have to answer quickly. Okay. Okay. So, be ready. All right, don't look. I'm not looking. Mm. Okay. What was the first concert you went to? Carmen. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> you? Amy Grant and Vince Gill. Okay. I don't I have no Yeah, idea. these are Christian artists that are oh, strange, amazing. strange. We have a very shared experience from yeah, love it. In different different states, but <laughs> so the fact good. that yours was Carmen and mine was yeah. Amy Grant. Okay. What song immediately brings back a memory? Ah. Uh, for me, Don Tree and I are the band that we kind of fell in love to was this band called uh, Third Eye Blind. And the first time I held her hand was this song that a lot of people don't know, but it, it goes like this. It goes, yeah, you do, you do, you do, you do, you do, you do, you do. You're making me want you. And like, I like, while we were driving in my Jeep, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you do, you do, you do. That happened. He still has that Jeep 17 years later. me want you. No, 20 years later. can't get enough. No, 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 no. So. When I hear that, it's like, dang, you know. Oh, I love yeah. it. Yeah. The love Do you remember back. what you felt I in that think, moment? Too? Oh, I remember it perfectly. Yeah, it was 20 years what ago. What you felt he like. still has like You felt instant attraction. Yeah. Deep. I loved it. Yeah. We were in love. Really it was awesome. Cool. You were already in love. Well, we had been long him. distance. We had been talking on the phone. So it was our first date, but we had been talking for months. Oh, my. You know, God. hours. Yeah. I started long distance with Gummy, yeah. so yeah. I get it. Okay, what song do you have on repeat right now? <sighs> uh... I mean, Casey Musgraves has been on repeat for a few years now. So mm. it's a constant in our house. What else? Uh, I'm listening to a whole lot of Coldplay constantly. Oh, Higher Coldplay power plays a lot. Yeah. Wow, it's so good. I love it. That's a great one right now. Favorite song to get you pumped up? Ooh, uh, Power Ooh. by Kanye West. I think anything like Bruno Mars. Get excited. Ooh, that's good. I wouldn't have thought that, yeah. DC. I love it. Song to set the mood. Ooh. Nora with a Jones. winky face. I love Nora. It says a winky face. So oh, the winky face. Oh, yeah. winky face. <laughs> Probably you think Shaw Day. Oh, yeah. Shaw Day for sure. Yeah. Do you know Shaw No. Oh. You, know, you don't know Shaw Day? I got it. Edit Shade. that out of the tape so she doesn't yes. know Shaw Day. Yes. Please um, do. Yeah, you, you know. <laughs> You'll love. Uh, but You'll love. do by do. your side. Um, 
Oh, when you're She's gone, not gonna know it, Rich. We're older I'll than her. I'll be there to hold you tight. Do me, do me. I'm gonna look these up as well, soon as you guys leave. This is no, no ordinary love. I know this, but I feel like I know this because you've sang it before oh, yeah. <laughs> somewhere. Oh, yeah. You gotta get shot down. I'm gonna, on your voice. I'm gonna help you guys' marriage. Here okay, thank you. What song title, that's song, last question. What song title would you use to describe yourself? Mm. Oh, wow. Wow. That one's not an easy one to think of. No. Uh, the best is yet to come. Frank Sinatra. Wow. wow. That's so good. Killer answer. Um, wow. That say. was fast. I'm trying to think of mine. I have no idea. You could just say could you, you guys one are one. Um, <laughs> what would you do for me? Hmm. Such a good question. That was, that was good. Fly though. me to the moon. Aww. Wow. Aww. I was going to say yellow by cold blood. <laughs> <laughs> or you have a little obsession with cold. Oh, uh, I would say clocks. Like, <laughs> what song title? Clock. Let's Time, see. timing. And then you would start one. thinking of something crazy to say. We did it, guys. I loved Absolutely. it. That's Thank so you good. For this, this last part was a lot of fun. I love, I love getting it. to know you guys more, and I'm going to write down the names. We've got, we got sure some albums. I'll make you a mixtape. My marriage has to get better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> with these music. With this music. It's, it. it's a healing agent. I love it. Thank you guys so much for coming. I love love chatting with you. Thank you for having us. We love being in your living room. Yes. Thank Thank you. You can come anytime and have more water in in coffee mugs. A huge thank you to Pastor Rich and Don Cherie for joining me in a really important conversation. We're dealing with a difficult time right now. So if you or anyone you know is struggling, we have a link below or you can call 1-800-273-8255 the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Thank you for watching and joining me, Eva Luna, aquí en La Sala. You can find me at Eva Luna in all platforms. Listen to this show every Wednesday and be sure to follow En La Sala on Amazon Music to get early access to episodes. Besitos!